understand the heritage that we enjoy here in this great valley and we hope you enjoy it the first white men probably to see this valley were probably the trappers and fur traders who followed the oregon trail after the arrival of the first settlers of chesterfield in 1875 Covered wagon trains continued to use the old Oregon Trail of 1846, which passed at this point. Tired, discouraged, and ill, travelers arrived here from early spring to late autumn. Local pioneers fed the hungry, nursed the sick, replenished their supplies, and exchanged fresh horses for weak or lame ones. The Chesterfield town site is located on the foothills close to the headwaters of the Port Niff River and the 24 Mile Creek. Chesterfield was first called 24 Mile because it was 24 miles northwest of Soda Springs. It is 11 miles north of Bancroft, the nearest railroad station, and 25 miles southeast of the old Fort Hall. The Fort Hall Indian Reservation joins Chesterfield with its Bannock and Shoshone Indians.
some Morrisite families from Soda Springs were the first settlers in Chesterfield. There were also three or four Sager families, about three Monroe families, and the West. Al McClough was the first Mormon settler who came here. He came in 1875 and lived on a ranch on Topons Creek. In 1878, Chester Call of Bountiful purchased several hundred head of church horses. The Mormon church in those days took stock for tithing. Chester Call had to find a place to keep them, so he took off on an extended scouting trip. He went to Oakley, Albion, Idaho Falls, into Wyoming, followed the Lander Trail up to Gray's Lake, down the Blackfoot across Corral Creek and Grave Creek, and on to the head of the Portniff where he came to the old Oregon Trail. This he found, followed down to the valley of the upper Portniff to where Chesterfield is now located. The valley looked good to him. It was a stockman's paradise. I'm Polly Janae McCammon. Much has been written of my great-grandfather, Chester Call. Of grandfather's four polygamist wives, two had homes here in Chesterfield. Although my great-grandmother, Mary Ann Julina, lived primarily in Bountiful, the little home that Chester built for her here on the town site is still standing. Grandfather was a bishop in Bountiful, Utah for 20 years, and during that time, he maintained his homes in Chesterfield and his farm here too. One of his best friends in Bountiful was Joseph Maybe. One Sunday, federal officers waited outside the Bountiful meeting house with plans to capture Bishop Call and arrest him for polygamy. Joseph Maybe took Chester's distinctive coat and hat, put them on, and ran like crazy out of the side door of the meeting house. The officers, sure that they were pursuing Chester Call, ran after him, and of course they captured the innocent and non-polygamous Brother Maybe. In the meantime, Bishop Chester Call had quietly slipped away and escaped. About 50 years later, Brother Maybe's grandson and Chester Call's granddaughter married and became my parents. Chester Call was a man of great vision and energy, and he possessed great persuasive skills in dealing with both the settlers and the Indians. Thousands of cattle roamed the low hills and valleys, and still the grass was knee-high. The war bonnet outfit ranched around 10,000 head, and Alexander Topons had that spring branded some 3,000 head on what is now Topons Creek. He learned that the previous summer, the region had been surveyed and opened up for homesteading. Considerable land in the upper Portniff Valley, was former, which was formerly believed to be on the reservation, was available now for settlement. Chester Call went back to Bountiful and encouraged his friends and relatives to come with him to this new place. In the, in the summer of 1879, Christian Nelson and Chester Call formed a partnership and moved their families and horses to the upper Portniff, where they acquired 320 acres of land along the river bottoms. I'm Marilla Nelson Tolman Call. Uh, Chester, Nelson, Chester Nelson is my grandfather. He was born in Denmark in 1845 and came to America uh, when he was eight years old with his family as the converts to the church. They came to Woods Cross. That's where he spent his childhood and his young manhood. And he did various things that the church required, colonizing and so forth. And then he married Vinnie Kopp. And... Uh, Vinny Call's grandfather, uh, Anson Bosco Call, and her uncle, Chester Call, and Chester Nelch, Christian Nelson, bought a band of horses and drove them to Chesterfield. And there's when he came to Chesterfield. He acquired some land, and he and his wife developed a fine farm. While here, he was called on a mission back to Denmark to his uh, native country. And uh, when he came back home, he brought some children from Denmark at various times, and my father was one of them. He came when he was four years old. Uh, Grandfather Nelson served in the bishopric to Judson A. Tolman, and he was Sunday school superintendent for some time. And, uh, of course, he helped to develop this country and stayed here until about 1901 when he went back to Bible. 
Jonathan Holbrook brought his wife and baby to Chesterfield in 1888. My name is Lake Holbrook. I was born and reared in Chesterfield, where I still live with my wife and five sons. My paternal grandparents came from Bountiful, Utah in the spring of 1888. That first summer, they lived in the wagon box, which they rode up in from Bountiful, Utah. Later, they built a home on the homestead on Tolman Creek, which today is owned by Paul Hatch, Jr. Born of the true pioneer spirit and with great strength of char character, it took them less than 40 years to carve a fortune out of the Chesterfield wilderness. Don, Don and Aunt Rose, as they were affectionately called, were the parents of 10 children. They ran a sawmill, raised cattle, sheep, and farmed several hundred acres. My grandfather purchased part of the original ranch from Chester Call, which is situated on 24 Mile Creek and which I still operate to this day. One of the first old homes of Chester Call still stands on that property. Grandfather was not necessarily a cattleman, but he was great with livestock. It was his want to ride a work horse, bareback, with a work bridle. One day as he rode, rode past the Chesterfield Church House, he noticed several people about and decided to stop and attend service. So he tied his horse up, and wearing his bib overalls, he went inside to the meeting. He was not too much embarrassed wherever he was in his bib overalls. However, he might have been that day had he known there was a large gaping hole in the seat of his trousers. My grandparents retired about eight, 1928 and returned to Bountiful, Utah, where they were born. They left a legacy at Chesterfield, which still flourishes to this day. This is a picture of Colonel Chester Loveland. He never lived in Chesterfield, but he brought some of his relatives here, who after seeing this valley, decided to stay. They were Heber, Chauncey, Frank, Elmer, and Anson Loveland. I am Marcel Ruger Hatch. Colonel Chester Loveland was my second great-grandfather. He was the first Loveland who joined the Mormon Church in Ohio. He. Uh, moved to Nauvoo and uh, suffered much persecution with the early saints. He was a captain of the Nauvoo Legion, appointed by Prophet Joseph. Uh, later, when after moving to uh, Utah, he was uh, appointed as a lieutenant colonel by President Brigham Young and uh, assigned to uh, form a regiment in the north, northern part of the Utah Territory. He later was appointed as a full colonel by the governor of the Utah Territory. Uh, from what we know, he didn't live in Chesterfield, but he did bring some of his family. His son, Heber Chauncey Loveland, who was my great-grandfather, uh, came with uh, Anson, uh, Elmer, and uh, Frank, who I think were cousins to my great-grandfather. My great-grandmother was Columbia Fillmore Call. She was the first white child born in Fillmore, Utah. Therefore, she was given the name of Fillmore. These two were lovingly called Uncle Heave and Aunt Lum by the people in Chesterfield. My great-grandfather passed away when I was one year old, so I don't remember him, but my great-grandmother lived till I was 13 or 14 years old, and I remember well spending time with her in her humble home, and what a lovely person she was. My uh, grandfather was their son, Josiah Howe Loveland, and his wife was Esther Ada King. He 
he was uh, known as Uncle Doad, and she is Aunt Ada. My mother was Florence, is Florence Ivanu Loveland, and she is still living. I'm grateful for my roots and my heritage in Chesterfield, and I am also happy to still be a member of the Chesterfield Ward and to have my youngest son as my bishop. This is a picture of Keller Sessions with his wife, Ann Call. I am Regretta Session Smith, the daughter of Kepler, the youngest daughter of Kepler Session. He was born in Bonneville, December 3rd, 1856. And at the age of 21, he was called to go on a mission to colonized sunset on the Colorado River, and all young men were supposed to be married. He didn't even have a girlfriend. He took the, his problem to his mother, and his mom suggested that he marry his cousin and call. They went to see Anne, and she was washing on the washboard in the shade of the house. And Father proposed to her, and he did it in a very business way. And uh, she, her reply was that she would have to consult her parents. And within a half hour, they had set the course of the rest of their life. They were married in the old endowment house. And uh, in three days, they were on their way to Arizona in Lock Smith Company. They were there for 18 months, and the oldest child was born and fall over there. They came back to Salt Lake on account of mother's health and they left there with a small piece of bacon and about 50 pounds of flour and some dried apples and father walked on the biggest part of the way and just shot rabbits to for meat for the their food to, in the, 1882, he came uh, to Chesterfield and filed on a 160-acre homestead and worked out at Bancroft and the railroad went through there and splitting ties to pay for the lumber to build his a four-room house. And the following fall, he moved his family into Chesterfield. To, he filled a mission in South Carolina for 26 months. And when the, the Idaho State was created uh, with Nelson J. Hogan as president, Kepler Sessions was set apart as the first counselor, and J. Fred Corbett as second counselor. And uh, when uh, they reorganized the state with uh, Fred Corbett as president, father was still second counselor. He uh, held the position for 17 years, and, and then he was set apart as patriarch of the, of the state in this position he held. As long as he lived, he died in 
Minnesota Springs Hospital and buried in Chesterfield Cemetery. Harley and Joseph Willie were cousins to Chester Call. In this picture, we see Parley Willie with his wife, Sarah Jean Pace. I'm Muriel Call. Uh, this is my grandfather, Chester Vincent Call. My grandmother, Anna Jeanette, and her sister was the second wife. She's Minaret. They were Swallow girls. Uh, Chester Vincent came to, to Chester via, Chesterfield, along with uh, his uncle, Chester Call. Uh, he married these two Barlow sisters, and they had, between them, uh, really 14 children. But 12, when they had 12, he was called on mission to South Carolina. And uh, he went two months before one child was born. He was gone for three full years, and uh, when he returned, each wife had another child. And the oldest son left at home was 17 years old. He tried to take the place of his father and did the best he could. could. Everybody helped. And uh, when he returned, they, there was great rejoicing, of course. Um, grandfather was highly respected. He was dignified. A little bit stern, but uh, very sure of what he said before he said it. And he was highly respected by his neighbors and friends and by his family. Uh, they raised a family in Chesterfield, and I think their youngest went on a mission after they left. But their home was Chesterfield until the family was all raised, and then they moved to Blackfield, Idaho. And my mother <clears throat> is the third child of Annis Jeanette, who's his first wife, and uh, she's here today, 98 years old, and she lives here with me. Yes. How do you feel, Mother? Oh, I feel pretty good, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> we get along fine, don't we? I hope so. <laughs> she's uh, not too active, but she takes care of herself and, and uh, enjoys her family and friends and everybody that comes to visit her. She really thrives on that. <clears throat> Tell something about some of your handwork, can you? Some of the things that you've done besides raising a family of five children. Well, I've done something all the time. <laughs> you know, one thing or another. I've crocheted quite a bit and just painted and, and several things that one does in our life. These are some of the Africans that she's made. She's made a great many of them. She's painted, made an oil painting for every one of her children and several grandchildren. We have a few around the house here and I think that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, this Chester Vincent Call and Anna Jeanette Barlow were mother's parents. One of Chesterfield's most famous inhabitants was Frank Robinson, the author of many Western novels. Information from the library at Brigham Young University indicate he authored 129 books, articles, and stories. He also wrote monthly articles for The Ranch, Romance, and The Old West. The people of Chesterfield were anxious each month to read these articles. His book, Ram in the Thicket, includes his adventures in Chesterfield. Here, Frank is pictured with his wife, Winnie Bowman. William, Ransom, Thomas, and Amos Hatch were early settlers in the Port Neuf Valley. This is my father, Osborne Wayne Hatch. He's going to tell us a little bit about these people. My uh, grandfather, Ransom Hatch, was one of the first ones that came into this valley with uh, my brother uh, Nelson. And then he later went back and got his brothers and brought them here. 
when they came in this time, they brought a herd of horses with them, which they had to water out north or south of uh, the Hatch area. They later settled and homesteaded in the Hatch area, which is also known as 18 Mile Creek. Grandma came up to this country uh, to visit with her brother, and while she was here, uh, this is when Grandpa met her. Uh, Grandma was also the first school teacher that came into the Hatch area. They were married in 1885. They raised eight children, all of which were born in the, on the homestead where Uncle Stearns lives at the present time. Several men came into this valley as cowboys. One of them was Jim Eldridge. He came as a cowboy and homesteaded west of the Charlie West home. Mike Whitworth, in his younger days, worked as foreman for Jim Eldridge. George A. Whitworth came also into this valley as a cowboy from Calls Fork. He married Catherine Griffith, and they had five children. Catherine later passed away, and he married a widow, Agnes William Davids, who is Denise White's grandmother. They later, later settled in the Ecom area. One other cowboy who was uh, noteworthy in the settling of this valley was Charles Albert Grant. I am Irma Mickelson Banks. I am a granddaughter to Charles Albert Grant. He was born in Salt Lake City and came to George Davis and Elizabeth Dubois Grant. And he was the first cousin to President Heber J. Grant. He came to Chesterfield when he was in his late 20s as a cowboy to work on the Eldridge Ranch and he also helped with the war bonnet roundup. His father had taught him to drive and to handle horses well. My grandfather first saw Elizabeth Ann Williams when rounding up cattle in the Hatch area. She, Elizabeth and Margaret Higginson were going to the spring for water. She had long, dark braids down her back with her bonnet hanging down her back and swinging her water bucket. And grandfather told Alma Clough, I'm going to marry that dark haired girl with him, it was love at first sight. Later, they were married in the Logan Temple. Nine children were born to this union, and my mother, Grace Grant Mickelson, is the last living child. Their first home was on the creek just below the, where Gary Hatch now lives. Then Grandfather took up a homestead near the foothills east of Chesterfield, which now is owned by Leif Holbrook. He and Thomas Hatch surveyed the road from Chesterfield to Bancroft with a team of horses and a hand plow and a Fresno scraper and the naked eye. The only change in this road is that instead of going around Jim Brown's reservoir, it now goes over the hill past Lawrence Holbrook's. He served in the Sunday School Presidency and as a counselor in the bishopric to Bishop Carl Loveland. And I'm glad that I could live in this valley where my grandparents settled. I'm Morris DeLoss Perkins. My father was Morris J. Perkins, whose father was Jasper Perkins. And my grandfather, Jasper Perkins, bought this log home from Gene Ruger about 1917. Uh, Grandpa Perkins would bring his family here from Corral Creek in the winter so the children could go to school uh, because he had to care for the cattle on Corral Creek. And he built a homemade sled and would carry butter and that he had churned and milk and other dairy products uh, from Corral Creek over here to Chesterfield, and he would bring these things through the mountains on a pair of skis, uh, pulling this homemade, homemade sled in back of him. And it was very, very difficult. Now this is a two-room cabin, and there wasn't enough room for his large family, so he built, uh, put a floor in the attic, and that's where the children slept. There were two beds there, and they slept four to a bed. My grandpa, grandfather Perkins' family consisted of himself and his wife, Ruth Farron Perkins, and the oldest son was Wayne, and there were also uh, five girls, Arita, Ida, Evelyn, 
Lucy, and LaVonda, and my father, Morris J. Perkins. They also had a boy, Wilson Perkins, who died in infancy. My Aunt Evelyn tells of a time when the family was sick with the flu, and many members in the community were also sick, and they were sleeping four to, bed, to a bed, but all sick with this flu, and how a county health nurse came around giving medication and uh, taking temperatures and so forth. And many people in this community died from that flu epidemic. My grandfather Perkins later sold this cabin and, move, and, and his homestead on Corral Creek and moved over to Toponce, where he was the sustained as bishop there for many, many years. I am Joel Davids, the son of Emery Willard and Hazel Call Davids. I am uh, the grandson of James Henry Davids. And uh, James Henry Davids was born in 1833 and a very interesting character in that he came west with Johnson's army to destroy the Mormons. And after their trip to Utah, on his return back east, he deserted somewhere in the Kansas area and took with him the army records and destroyed them and returned then to Utah. He there married an Indian girl, Ruth Pyheed Call. This is Grandma Ruth Pyheed Call, who married my grandfather, James Henry Davids, in Utah. <clears throat> they were sent to the Chesterfield area as pioneers and settlers of this area. They were presumably the eighth family into the area from the Cache, from uh, Gentile Valley to the head of the Fort Neff River. Uh, they homesteaded just south of the old Chesterfield town site, and uh, my grandfather was a mason by trade, and he done a, a lot of the masonry work on this, the Chesterfield chapel and other brick buildings, especially in the Chesterfield area. He built a log cabin in which he and grandmother raised their family. Uh, Grandma Ruth was a colorful person in that she uh, was a midwife along with other abilities to nurse the sick. As she traveled throughout our area, she picked up roots and other things that she made into medicines and was able to administer disease with these things to those who were sick. Grandma Ruth uh, was said to have had some of the softest hands when she administered to the sick that older people had ever felt. She was a terrific person in our opinion and was quite uh, old when she found out that there was a little difference between her and the other children that she grew up with. Uh, she was loved very much by the pioneers and was lovingly called Aunt 